Thank you, Rory. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here to speak about uh, my work. Um, let me try to think about what I'm going to say or how to approach this kind of formally. In my other um, life, in my day job as an academic historian and teacher, I speak a lot, but the premise of those conversations is that you know, I'm doing this kind of research and I'm supposed to be able to back up everything that I say to my students or when I'm speaking, you know, from that kind of setting. But this is really, I'm kind of trying to do just the opposite of that. And I won't be able to back up really anything that I say. And I hope that it doesn't uh, add up to anything which it's supposed to do in the other setting too. So I'm just going to go through um, three kind of sections of, uh, these are three, um, well, the first two are, are works or sets of works of mine in the past couple of years, uh, and then some newer things, The Matrix, which is a, a tape that came out recently in The Holy Restaurant, which is a piece that I'm working on now, um, but I'm going to use these three kind of sections of the next 90 or so minutes, a little less than 90 minutes, um, to... I don't know, just speak about what I was thinking about when I was making them and what I think is still interesting about them, if anything, um, and mostly use it as an excuse to talk about other people's music, other people's work, uh, through the kind of lens or the jumping off point of my own work. But if there's obviously anything that jumps out at you and you want to know more, you don't even have to wait till the end. You can just interrupt and shout and we can have a discussion. Um, we'll listen to some things too. Uh, maybe more and maybe less, depending on how much I end up talking. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really glad to be uh, visiting with you all and, and hanging with Rory and Echo over the last couple of days. It's been really nice, too. Um, so the first kind of set of things that I want to talk about is a series of um, long-form works that I made starting in 2020 that I sort of imagine is still ongoing, uh, called To the Planetarium. Um, the title to the planetarium came from a, well, I guess I can just look on my computer right here, um, came from a section of a book by Walter Benjamin called One Way Street. And the interesting thing about this book, one of the interesting kind of formal things is that all of the sections, the titles are taken from kind of bits of language, street signs, um, advertisements, things like that, that were that are just in the city where he was kind of walking around and each of these street signs or advertisements or little bits of, of language in the city become these kind of jumping off points for thinking about um, whatever he's thinking about. So these are some examples. He'll see a sign that says betting office and that will be the kind of spark that um, leads to this kind of uh, meditation. And this is, you know, he has this very kind of elliptical uh, style and very interested in kind of l tiny little fragments of language that come out um, and then become drawn out as sparks uh, for a different kind of thought. And I was really kind of inspired by that form. Um, so, you know, betting office, stand up beer hall, no vagrants would be a sign. And then the final um, section in the book is to the planetarium. So the uh, premise, as I imagine it, is that he's walking around Berlin, I guess it would be, um, and sees a sign that is directing pedestrians how to get to the planetarium. But then this notion, this, this sort of linguistic fragment to the planetarium then sparks this other thought for him about, um, you can read a little bit of it there, but um, it's some of it's quite impenetrable, but the cosmos and science and history and all the things that he's interested in. Um, but the spark that that created for me, is the sound okay also for everybody? Everybody can hear me okay? Good. Um, the spark that that created for me was a connection to um, a very different uh, kind of setting, which is the Astor Place riot, which took place in New York um, in the middle of the 19th century. This is a picture of the riot. Um, this is what Astor Place looks like now. That's a Walgreens now, or maybe a CVS on the corner where the Astor Place Opera House was. Um, What's the British equivalent of Walgreens? Boots. Yeah, it's like a boots. 
um, and a Starbucks, as you can see. So the Astor Place riot was uh, um, started as a, um, I guess, a kind of cultural, theatrical um, a conflict or, or uh, rivalry between two Shakespearean actors, a British actor and an American actor. And there was a kind of uh, argument over who was better at representing, um, I don't remember, I think maybe it was King Lear actually, but that was being performed at the Astor uh, Place Opera House, um, which is there, the CBS. Um, and in the cor of course, it was this course sort of cultural rivalry, rivalry, which was actually a proxy for the class warfare in the mid 19th century in New York City. Um, uh, I think the premise was that it was a kind of like the aristocracy in New York were supporting the uh, British actor, and then the um, immigrants and the lower class working working class New Yorkers who would go to the theater as a sort of form of popular entertainment were favoring the American actor. But one of the interesting kind of anecdotes about the the riots as they happened, which was also the first place. Uh, I think the first instance in which the NYPD were deployed as a kind of like um, uh, riot quelling, but really riot inducing force by the city. Um, the people that were rioting, I'm guessing the NYPD didn't say this part, but the people that were rioting had the, the rallying call of to the opera house, which was a way for them to, to name where they were going to continue rioting and breaking windows and fighting each other in the street and everything. And uh, I was reading about the Astor Place riot at the same time as I was reading um, One Way Street and this kind of morphology of to the planetarium and to the opera house were kind of um, sparking in my mind. And it made me think about uh, if in the Astor Place riot, the rallying cry of to the opera house was a kind of um, a signal for a group of people to go to a place which was then going to be a physical site of um, physical violence in the street, but also kind of larger um, class conflict or cultural conflict or something, then to kind of use that sense of that morphology and bring that back into the sense of the planetarium. So then to like, what would it, what kind of riot would call for it? to the planetarium, like we're gonna go to the planetarium and riot there. Um, and putting these two things next to each other was uh, uh, formed the, the form of the title, but then kind of influenced the way that the uh, piece was put together in, in ways that um, I don't know if I can really account for, but we'll, we'll listen to a little bit in a, um, in a few minutes. Um, so this notion of the, of the spark that I've been mentioning, this sort of Benjaminian thing of taking a little bit of language and sparking it and making it sort of turn into something else um, has been really interesting to me recently. And I've been connecting that in my mind with uh, some elements of the Zohar and the Judaic mystic tradition, Kabbalistic tradition. Um, this is just a little segment of some stuff I've been looking at uh, that I'll just read aloud, although that may be tedious, but just for purposes of, of being able to hear it and see it. Um, in the creation myth of ancient Judaic mysticism, God creates, again, I can just read it on my computer. Uh, in the creation myth of ancient Ju Judaic mysticism, God creates the universe by a process dubbed tzimtzum, which in Hebrew means a sort of stepping back to allow for there to be an other, an else, as in something or someone else. Um, I already like this idea because it's not really the sense that I normally had in mind where like there's a kind of positive like yeah I am creating this now but it's actually like a, a, with, a bit of a withdrawal and then an allowing something else to appear the kind of poetics of uh, or the dynamics really of, of um, appearance I'm going to be thinking about a lot I'll say a little bit more about that in in a few minutes um, when God decided to bring this world into being to make room for creation he first drew in his breath con contracting himself. From that contraction, darkness was created. And when God said, let there be light, the light that came into being filled the darkness, and ten holy vessels came forth, each filled with primordial light. 
so it's like 10 ships full of light going into the world and that's what's sort of created but god has to sort of step back for that to um happen in this way god sent forth those 10 vessels like a fleet of ships each carrying its cargo of light had they all arrived intact the world would have been perfect but the vessels were too fragile to contain such a powerful divine light they broke open, split asunder, and all the holy sparks were scattered like sand, like seeds, like stars. This is already also a really interesting thing. Like, why were the vessels not strong enough to carry the light if presumably the vessels were also of God's own creation? It's like a the original breaking of the sort of premise of what was happening, which is already really interesting to me. Um, that is why we were created, to gather the sparks no matter where they're hidden. And when enough holy sparks have been gathered, the broken vessels will be restored, and Tikkun Olam, the repair of the world awaited so long, will finally be complete. Therefore, it should be the aim of everyone to raise these sparks from wherever they are imprisoned and to elevate them to holiness by the power of their soul. Um, so this notion of like looking for sparks out in the world and kind of weaving them together is a um, one that I found really interesting and and capacious for thinking about a lot of making making work. Uh, I've also been thinking recently about how like I think hidden treasures are a real like theme in a lot of well uh, I'm, I'm gonna pause there I'm not gonna talk about hidden treasure uh, but one thing that actually is interesting and important about this passage um, and there's many different ways that this this sort of spark theory of the universe is described in, in different texts and different languages and everything. Um, but it seems to me that there's two kind of ways to orient yourself towards this. And one is that the creation of sparks or the, or the um, seeking out and collection of sparks and the arrangement of sparks is uh, predicated on the sense that you're putting back together a kind of like primordial whole or place or home land or nation form or something like that. But then there's another sense of it where it's a sort of, um, I could say centrifugal rather than centripetal. So a sort of out, outgoing um, process of spark collection that doesn't lead back to a sort of single stable center. Um, and it's this latter form that I think I'm at least aspiring to um, work in a little bit more. And that's kind of my orientation around that comes from spending a, a long time, many years, thinking about this uh, statement that uh, Kafka apparently made, uh, which is that the alternative to Zionism is the Kabbalah. Um, so trying to think of Kabbalah as an outward outward motion that doesn't sort of try to um, trace back and, and erase a bunch of uh, complex political realities in, in doing so. So it's not like a nation, it's not a nation myth, it's kind of the opposite of that. I hope. Um, so thinking a little bit more about the planetarium, um, this is the Adler Planetarium, Chicago, where I grew up. Um, and then this is a picture that uh, my dad took of, of um, the loop, which is the little magnifying glass that I guess sometimes come. It, it, I think it's a term that's used mostly for jewelers. Jewelers have this little piece of magnifying glass that they look at jewelry um, in order to assess its purity or whatever. Um, but when I was growing up, we had this uh, dictionary with really small print, and we had this loop. And so you would sort of roll this smooth glass dome over the um, pages of the dictionary, and it would, ampl it would uh, amplify, magnify the, the words. Um, and then thinking about the sort of spark between the the morphology of the planetarium, which is domed and is meant to be looked out into the cosmos, versus the loop, which is domed and is meant to be looked in, but then also kind of asking some foolish questions about that, which is about what maybe both both are two-way observatories. Um, so the cosmos, so to speak, is looking also at us in the planetarium and in the dictionary, the words are also looking back out at us, which also then means that we are words lined up alphabetically when we're in the planetarium. Um, so these kinds of crises of scale and asking what kinds of weird um, and kind of corrupt analogies we can make through that and just exploring some of those ideas. Um, 
And that link then between the us as looking people or or interested seeking people inside the planetarium and uh, the words in the dictionary lined up um, also made me think a little bit about uh, this sense of um, so that I have here just Adamic language, but you know so there's the there's the kind of given idea that language is arbitrary and conventional, right? This is a, this is a sort of Saussure 101, but this, this principle in the philosophy of language that there's nothing about the word tree, there's nothing about the sound of the word tree that actually indicates tree. That's the arbitrariness thesis, right? Um, which is then proven or sustained by the fact that it, but the word for tree in any other language is just as valid a uh, uh, indication of that word as the English word tree is. Um, and so where does language get its meaningfulness from, if not from an, an innate or indexical link between the sound image, the word, and the, and the idea that it signifies from conventionality, the fact that we agree that, it, that it, when I say tree, you have some version of a tree in mind, right? This is sort of like modern philosophy of language, but what that is overturning, or what that's kind of um, moving away from, is what's sometimes referred to, as far as I understand it, as the Adamic theory of language, or a kind of um, uh, older, pre-modern, pre-enlightenment, um, more sacred um, philosophy of language, where there actually is a, an innate link between words and things, um, and it reframes uh, the linguistic scene of the Garden of Eden as um, Adam and Eve are the namers of the world, and they sort of like distribute these names, which are the uh, the real names for the things. And so it's a kind of like um, somewhat foolish but quite serious re rebuke of the idea that there's actually no innate link. And it's it, you know I think I think that this is a, a principle that a lot of uh, people who are interested in writing and poetry and various um, manifestations have gotten a lot of mileage out of because it uh, it gets us out of, it almost like re-enchants a sense of language as not just um, arbitrary and conventional, which is already, I mean, conventionality is already a very enchanted thing because that's a principle of community and language that's often really suppressed. Um, whatever, we can talk about that more if, if we want to, but, um, but thinking of the words in the dictionary and the people in the planetarium as uh, of the same kind of um, spiritual status or something like that um, has been has been an interesting place to go off of and I think this this sense of letting something like signifiers sonic signifiers or or words um, be full be kind of like these objects that you have to kind of contend with the personality of as opposed to just um, put them in the grid of indexical meaning um, has been a, a fruitful way for me to put some of the stuff in to the planetarium together. I realize we're far away from anything musical. We're, maybe we'll listen to some music in a little bit, but um, this is the kind of, this was the background for me to approach um, some of this stuff. Uh, this is just a really bad pixelated version of a uh, painting that I really like that I saw recently in New York. Um, it's massive. I don't know, maybe like 30 feet across or something like that. Um, but uh, feels like a kind of another picture of like what the interior of the um, planetarium that I have in mind might look like. Um, another kind of principle of, of um, I don't know about principle of Kabbalistic thought, but another kind of passage in the Zohar. The Zohar is the book, the, the, one of the central books of, of um, Jewish mysticism. Um, and a really interesting passage in the Zohar describes the structure of the universe as um, a series of concentric palaces where there's brains and membranes. It's all just cascading brains and membranes all the way down. Um, so the brain is the kind of uh, light, the spark. So we could uh, uh, relate this to um, the shard and vessel theory in a certain kind of way, where like the shard 
uh, or the spark and vessel theory, rather, where the spark is the brain and it's this kind of luminous um, entity and it's covered by a membrane which then glows by having the, by having the spark inside of it. Um, but then the membrane, when it's glowing, also then becomes its own kind of brain, which then has a membrane outside of it. And these become like a, a, a brain in its membrane is a palace, I guess, in the language of the way this stuff is put together. And so thinking about um, the kind of spatiality of, of uh, how the world works according to the spark, spark and vessel theory, um, it's, uh, I, I like thinking about it as a series of concentric palaces because it makes absolutely no sense, but it's really beautiful. Um, and this feels like that, but also I can't totally tell. This is such a terrible representation of it, I shouldn't have even put it on there, but you, it, when you're looking at the thing, um, you can't tell if it's like bright or dark. I mean, you can, it's a question here, right? Like I don't, this bit in the middle on the roof, like whether that's like a warmth or whether that's like a rust or something, I can't quite tell. And this. Like, does this membrane have the brain in it? Um, or like, what part of the palace are we, are we looking at? Um, also, just the scale of it is really massive. And, and to the planetarium, the, the piece or pieces are uh, very, very long. Um, so I've been interested in this stuff about uh, scale. Uh, yes, that's the name of the painting, the Dene. Um, and it's in a show that was just in New York uh, called Exodus. Um, and yeah, it's kind of funny too because uh, a lot of the other stuff is this kind of like deeply, um, I don't even know the word, like scary large images of, of hollowed out architecture um, that feels extremely terrifying to look at. Uh, and then this is kind of in the next room, and I can't, like, I'm really, really drawn to this in the way that all the other paintings are, um, uh, yeah, quite quite terrifying. Um, this is really captivating in a different kind of way, I think because of, like, the scale and the perspective, but also the um, weird brain membrane quality of it. Um, but yeah, Dene is the... Uh, name of the painting. I don't know who that is. That's a character from Greek mythology, but if anybody knows, um, shout it out, or we can talk about it later. Um, let me see what time it is. Uh, maybe I'll skip some of this. This is uh, some bits, some more bits. Um, Rilke, Rilke poem that I've been interested in for a long time, which has this kind of notion of brain and membrane, where he's looking at the uh, torso monumental fragment of a, of a statue of Apollo, and um, he has an intense experience looking at this um, uh, statue. It has this famous last line, you must change your life. But yeah, well, I could say a lot more about that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass over it. Um, some arcades project. I want to listen to a little bit of uh, to the planetarium now. It was commissioned by a place in New York called the Issue Project Room, who at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic commissioned a bunch of artists to do um, uh, live stream uh, performances, commission new works for that kind of thing. And so I worked on a um, very, very long thing, which ended up being about four hours, a little under four hours long. Uh, and maybe we'll just listen to the first few minutes and I might talk a little bit over it. Good night, 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 good night,
grandmother at her house in Florida, and it's, what is it, it's July 2nd, it's 4th of July weekend, and we're going over our family tree. And we're going to go way back. Well, we're going to start with Grandma Etta's great-grandparents on her mother's side. So, so, tell me this, what is it? Eagle I want Steve? you to know I am Dawn's grandmother, and I will be 88 years old, July 19, 1998. And if I don't remember anything, you'll have to forgive me, <laughs> because I should have started this uh, 30 years ago when a lot of the family was around. But however, we're going to start with my great-grandparents on my mother's side. So the name was uh, so this is a, um, and, uh Maybe Jessica. in the chat on the Zoom, and my dad can put in the right relation because he's on the Zoom right my, now. My um, but this is a... a whose name was Yen dad, what is it? This is a, I Yen believe this is my I grandmother's aunt. Because I didn't like the name of uh, Yeda. If he says something, anyway, just shout anyway, it out. Anyway, <laughs> um, they had... Uh, they were married to, uh, my, my grandmother was married to uh, Nissan Geller, which was Nathan Geller. So in, uh, in uh, I don't know, in Europe, I think 2015 a long time or so. Um, and they came from Chanowitz, a couple of years which was after or uh, at that time. my they grandfather passed, my dad's dad the, passed, um, my there. grandmother, so, um, it was uh, Polly, Polly gave me a Romania. box of cassette One tapes of the that they had had so in their that? apartment that, going back to um, that were various um, well, there was something in the various things, some like it, the, yeah. all the grandkids fooling wow. around as as little kids, or interviews years, that my uh, grandfather had done with his neighbors to write for the and local paper, um, and other kinds so of like family-related archival genealogical um, okay. interviews. And this and is one of them. So one, two, three, this is Dawn, who's the younger person interviewing Aunt Etta, neither of whom I think I've ever met, but the what they're describing, um, yeah. as gr grandparents and great-grandparents uh, are my great-great-great-grandparents also. That's sort of like an oblique perspective on it. Uh, uh, Your grandmother was Barbara yeah. and married Nisa. Yeah. Right, right, so my grandmother's and aunt. And yeah, yeah, yeah. She had yeah. Several, Thanks, Dad. Several sisters and brothers, uh, what their names? Yeah, who are they? The Jewish name. They That's okay. Been. One was uh, Mendel Edelstein, and the other one was Abe Edelstein, and uh, Ruth Edelstein, and uh, m uh, my grandmother was Barbara Edelstein. Now, when when your grandmother was married, was she still living in Poland, or did no, she come no, here she to came stay? To America. It's a little. And where um, did she come to New York? Yeah, you have to sort of, uh, if you want, uh, give the benefit of the doubt to well, listen to little snippets because this, the whole uh, point of this piece, the way that this piece has been put one, together two, three, and will four, continue to be children. put together, is about right. scale. And, uh, um, and that it's the and fact that it's Morris, extremely long um, is York part of the point. First. And so, you know, I want to listen to maybe like a few more minutes of it or something. Okay. And then um, he brought my mother and my uncle Louis over. Part but of the uh, premise that I'm trying to get to is that, um, as opposed to Europe, bringing in all these archival here. audio materials they and then weaving it really, really kind of like minutely into a 40-minute form or a 20-minute, 25-minute concert form or something, is to really let those artifacts be full and in themselves and let them kind of go, which means that you have to... Um, make work that's extremely long. Yeah, so this version of the piece is, four, is about four hours, as I was yeah. saying. And but then over uh, the next couple of uh, years, I turned here, it into a serial, um, my and rather my extended it yeah. into a serial kind of radio show format where there was another uh, he was in the catering business, like six or seven hours added to it. To um, but it became okay. this kind of way then, for me uh, to one um, day she was cooking a meal have a and he framework, said hold Regina, a frame for um, this is, uh, a, a kind of montage language to be developed that I could just inhabit and it wouldn't have to be sort of shortened down to these like, you know, because it'd be very different if I was just taking out one provocative exchange between Dawn and Etta and snipped it into between like some weird 
tape sounds and then like that little epigraph at the beginning of the two women saying good night over and over again but to actually like let this uh, tape run for the full 10 minutes that it exists is kind of part of the um, it puts me in a, a different relationship with the material and the work in a different way it makes me a little bit more um, listening as a researcher as an interested kind of listener as opposed to um, trying to manifest some sort of control of the materials. And I found that the only way that I could do that was to just uh, extend it, let the pieces be uh, the size that they are. Um, so we're going to get like an artificial picture of that and only listening to a clip. But I don't think so, but he was the one that made the the matchmaking. So when, when the men in the family were to be married, how they weren't... Well, no, that, no, they well, did They would see, they were one, two, three, four brothers and one sister. So it was Morris, Aaron, and Nathan as brothers. And, and Louis, my uncle Louis was also a brother. Louis. See, Morris, Aaron, and Louis, and my mother were in America. He was left behind. Right. Nathan was left behind. So they felt it was their duty to take care of yeah, Regina. So they made this, uh, they called it, in my language, a shit up, a matchmaking thing. Okay. And uh, she married my father. Okay. And that, uh, she never met my father before, but that night she met him. And uh, in those days, you know, I guess you could do those things. You can't do them today. In other countries, they still do it, but they don't, they don't, they don't do, do it here do too much, much. no. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, then they got married in uh, 1910, and then um, they had... Uh, yeah, letting the, uh, letting the uh, passages uh, go so creates this kind of like distance in a weird way between me and the so stuff that I've found uh, uh, important. What she holds, the trumpet in the book, and also the laurel leaves on her head. So she's an allegorical figure. We might think about the Statue of Liberty, for example. So that idea of the painting's power to transform is actually central to this, this is image. an audio clip from two art historians in a sort of public setting Look describing the, the, um, the art of painting by Vermeer that, and the, the figure that's being painted is Cleo, who's the muse of history. A scene that we don't normally get to see. If you look at that curtain that's been drawn back, it's a kind of interesting optical quality. This it's is a also a little artificial focus. because when it you're listening to the piece, presumably, the unless you're like really good it's art history, you wouldn't know that this is what is being described and you wouldn't be looking at it, but I do like the painting. Himself is looking at, that is his model. That's where we start to see a clarified focus. And it's almost as if the painting has a depth of field, so much so that some art historians have suggested that perhaps he was using a camera obscura that is a kind of simple early camera without film to begin to process the transformation of the three-dimensional onto the two-dimensional plane. And the subject always with Vermeer is light. We don't see the source of the light which is behind that curtain but the light filters onto the chandelier above, onto the muse of history, onto the objects on the table, across the floor, on the artist's stockinged feet on the tiles, catching the brass tacks on that upholstered chair on the right. I mean, we can follow its pathway. I especially love the way the light catches the ridging on the map itself and creates those highlights and shadows. And look at the art. So then with this sort of framework of the sparks and the vessels in mind, then the, the, these two art historians describing the light in this painting on the Muse of History um, becomes a little bit more uh, multi-dimensional. It speaks to the other parts in the um, in the piece in a way. At least for me, when I'm when I was putting it together. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see how it's a little bit foolish to just list. I mean, the pieces, the the little segments themselves are a little bit like n dreadful and not necessarily worth that kind of attention. But when they're um, at least the gambit is that when they're strung together in a certain kind of way and there's a connection between the elements, even if the connection is submerged, it makes it um, somehow worth exploring or, or um, thinking about why two things are next to each other in a particular kind of way. Um, and so that's kind of what the serial form of To the Planetarium has been about. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic also, um, my partner and I, Emily, have been doing, uh, like, to, especially in the first couple of um, 
years or the first year or so of lockdown, very intense lockdown, uh, we started um, watching or sort of like doing this kind of at home um, two person movie ma series marathon, movie marathon, I guess not marathon, but like we call it staff picks. But basically it's like uh, instead of, you know, the sort of uh, uh, pain of trying to decide with your domestic partner what you want to watch at the end of a day or something like that. It would be like one person just puts something on and the other person doesn't know what it's going to be until um, until it's on. It's just like a way to make the time pass a little bit faster in mid-2020 that we've continued to do, which has been really um, great and turned into an institution in our little society of two. But um, the way that it ended up developing is that uh, the next person's staff pick had to be had to have some kind of spark connection with the previous staff pick, but the connection was also submerged. So, you know, if we're like watching a movie about animals or something, actually, maybe in the next slide, I accidentally have some of these together. Um, I can go back to slide mode. Uh, I don't remember if these two were right next to each other, but uh, on the left, bottom left, is a screenshot from um, a movie by Alice Rohrwacher called Corpus Celeste, which I really love, and is sort of using these themes of uh, children's music and religious music, um, which I'm, I've already spent too long talking about to the planetarium, so I'm not going to go into that too deeply. And then this is a little bit from Andrei Rublev. Um, but the connection between these two and the staff picks was kind of like religious religious music type of theme. But there's a principle in the in the um, in the notion that the next staff pick has to be connected to the previous one, but you don't know what the connection is, which is also the principle of the way to the planetarium is put together, um, which is, you know, there's m most of the things, I was gonna play some more from a, from a later iteration to the planetarium, and the parts, I guess, are I want to be ready, croissants and totality and trivial pursuit. What the connection is between those three things, I don't remember anymore. But the fact that they're there and it was arranged in a particular kind of way that felt like it held a spark in that moment um, was what made it worth uh, putting together in that particular way. Um, so it's a bit funny to go back and, and look at this stuff after several years. But that's kind of the um, hidden principle behind this work. Um, oh yeah, this is just another. Uh, um, formal kind of um, inspiration reference for me, John Acomfra, Nine Muses. Um, and one thing that Arthur Jaffa sa said about John Acomfra, Arthur, Arthur Jaffa is also an amazing filmmaker. Um, uh, at the end of the day, you want to take one thing and put it in affective proximity to another thing. And so af affective proximity, I think, is, a, is another way of talking about the sparks that um, I've been kind of exploring here. Uh, also, more specifically in the John Acomfra and Arthur Jaffa does this a lot too, the connection between archival um, footage and sort of footage that has been shot for the purpose at hand. So the lower left um, in Nine Muses, the Acomfra film is is shot as this kind of like connective tissue tableau footage, uh, which then is connected with all this other ar archival footage that he finds. So that kind of use of um, the archive and the self-made material um, is a big uh, touch point for me. Okay, I'm going to move on to the second um, bit and maybe try to move a little bit faster. Uh, so that was to the planetarium and this second bit, which I'm kind of referring to as the E catalog, um, is the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of scale. Um, these are very, very small, short piano um, bits. I don't totally know what to call them, but these um, came about also around 2020 when I was mostly um, making all the music I could make on my computer in my apartment um, and not having access to playing with other people or uh, to a, a piano, an actual piano. Um, and so what I started to do was go through, go back through um, a several hundred hour archive that I have of cell phone recordings of myself playing various pianos over the past um, 15 years or so um, that are just stored away on various hard drives and um, which are all 
really dreadful to listen to and wouldn't want to do that kind of thing with them. I wouldn't want to um, present them in a kind of unmediated way and going through them and for uh, kind of boring computer related purposes, I stumbled upon um, uh, a, a, a little segment of one of these recordings that um, kind of got separated from the rest of the of the um, recording or the footage and then uh, on accident began to loop playing on my computer, which I hadn't intended to do and wouldn't have thought of that as something to do with this. But um, uh, this is catching something for me of my relationship to the piano as an instrument, which I don't really play or I don't identify really as playing, um, but was maybe similarly to, to the planetarium in some ways, um, allowed me to go into uh, an archive of massive and massive amount of sound, in this case, the archive of myself goofing around at a, at a keyboard in um, very amateur ways, and then finding really small um, snatches of music in there that because of my sort of um, slightly off-kilter relationship to the instrument and lack of formal training, there were some utterances that sounded like um, worth listening to a little bit more because they had the kind of weirdness of everyday speech and um, kind of non-idiomatic uh, sounding harmonies or something. And so I've been exploring these very, very minute little uh, forms. Um, and I'll play a couple, a couple of these. Um, part of my process with this has been to f go through and, and comb through and find these little bits um, and then also to learn again to play them um, and transcribe them in some cases. So I have a transcription here if, if anybody wants to follow along, but let's listen to this one. here that makes it interesting for me at least to, to listen to is that I don't know if this is clear from my description but it was it was never played like this like this is one little segment in like a say a two-hour cell phone recording where you know maybe I've been like practicing a particular piece or something or learning some particular music and then I'm just like you know fucking around on the instrument for a while and this is one little um, passage that would have gone through this opening section before the repeat sign um, and then just continued at the end and not repeated in any way but to kind of like um, extract that and find something I mean I don't know this is kind of like I'm at the edge of my like music theoretical training or whatever but um, there's like kind of some harmonic things that are a little bit interesting about it and it's rhythmically a little bit strange and off and I it's it's a way for me to kind of like I guess catch myself in the act or get at some music behind my own back in a way because if I had sat down and set out to um, compose a little a sweet little piece that was this long and repeated so many times the outcome I imagine would have been more like 
straightforward or saccharine or not quite, um, it wouldn't have had that strange um, kind of off kilter quality. But it's basically like the the you know recordings of me muttering to myself for hours on end, and then finding a little moment where I've said something which was interesting to hear myself mutter, and then just spending a little bit of time with that sound or with that language. And so there's a kind of like background premise, and I don't really know if the outcome is worth thinking about. I mean, I've, I've, I, for a lot of the um, pandemic being home and not performing and stuff like that, uh, this was kind of the only thing I had the uh, attention span to work on, either, either to the planetarium, which is like n endless form, basically open serial form like radio, or these little like 25 second things and I could only sort of be in the very very small or the very very big um, but I've shown this music the little piano stuff to um, a bunch of friends who are musicians and artists and composers and some of them really like them and some of them really really don't like them um, and so I'm, I'm sort of like I now give them to you all and you can actually don't tell me if you don't like them but um, but yeah there's something there's something just a little bit captivating to me about this process of having an archive to work in, so it's not like I'm sitting down and being creative at the keyboard, which is not what I do at the keyboard, um, but I can sort of listen in a way that's, um, I don't know, activates a certain uh, uh, part of my brain that I've really, um, that I've really kind of attached to musically, but hasn't been a part of my sort of composerly um, mentality. And I think that a lot of that comes from, um, growing up and transcribing music a lot. So listening to something over and over and over and over and over again, and then writing it out and learning it on whatever instrument. Um, my original instrument was the uh, drums. And when I was like 12 or 13, like learned the drums basically through like transcribing you know, Green Day beats and like Smashing Pumpkins beats and stuff like that. And like that kind of relationship to music where I'm just like obsessing over these tiny little details has been, um, not something that I would do in my normal practice until I found myself kind of looking at my own archive and transcribing those and listening to things with that kind of ear for like, oh, what was that strange little thing that happened there? Like, is that worth listening to over and over and over again? And I still don't know, but I think that's part of where it comes from. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. These were two other examples of these little uh, pieces that after listening to them much later, I found, um, or sort of like put back together almost like autobiographically, like what kinds of, what things I was listening to a lot of or um, learning on piano at the time that was influencing the way that my hands were moving like that because um, because I don't have like formal training. It's all gonna be a little bit like, I'm, I'm a lot more porous, I think, so a lot of my, time at the piano is spent learning pieces that I'm interested in or learning them very, very slowly. Uh, and then I sort of absorb a lot of that pianistic mechanical language and harmonic language. So um, I'm going to skip it, but there was a, a bit where uh, I was learning, was sort of writing a piano arrangement of this really beautiful Arvo Pert chorale that I'll just have on while I yap about it, um, which has this very specific um, harmonic process method that he calls tintinabulation, which we can talk about in the Q&A if folks are interested in it, but um, gives it this kind of funny, half-moving, half-static harmonic language, which I was really captivated by for a while and arranged this piece for a chamber ensemble for a piece of mine called Curtain in 2017. Um, but this is a, when I was transcribing this for piano, it made my hands move in a specific kind of way that then I could hear the influence of in some of the, uh, um, in some of the little E catalog pieces. Um, we'll just listen through like one repetition of this. And if you can, this is a little bit hard from like a ear and mind point of view, but if you can, in the second part of this re repetitive bit, listen to the second highest voice. Um, not yet, I'll tell you what. Here. You can hear 
that middle voice. It's not the melody. The melody is way up there, but there's another thing in the middle, which is, um, it's not exactly the same as how tintinabulation works, Arvo Parrott's method, but it is a similar principle where there's an, um, two voices that are right next to each other are moving in different, with different melodic rules, basically, that one of them is arpeggiating a tonic triad. This isn't a music theory class, so don't worry about this, but like, um, there's, a, there's a kind of, I always have to say that to my students when I go off on a music theory thing, because I don't teach in a music department. Um, anyway, the connection, listening back to this one years later and being like, oh, this was made while I was working on that um, Arvo Pear transcription, and I can hear in this microscopic little move of my thumb, like I wouldn't have, my thumb wouldn't have moved in that direction if I wasn't completely immersed in this other sound at that time. So it becomes kind of an interesting framework for me to um, track some of my influences over the years. Um, no, no Lester Young, maybe later if we have time. Uh, the other, this is the last thing I'll say about the E catalog. Um, the other uh, big influence here was I, I read this thing in 2016 or 2017 or something that had described a really a, one specific chord in this piece, which is an intermezzo by Johannes Brahms, that one chord made this writer who was writing about it feel like consolation for living a basically unsatisfying life. And I thought that was the most outrageous thing that you could say about, like, I was like so offended that he said that, but then also like couldn't look away. And so like spent the next two years learning to play this piece just to see if I could feel consoled or something. Um, and I don't remember if I do, but I did fool myself into learning this piece over the course of two years. So joke is on me, I guess. Um, but uh, there's a bunch of, um, a bunch of the stuff in the e catalog that that I hear is coming out of um, spending a ton of time in this music and sort of getting Brahms's harmonic language in my head and then turning it into these little nothing nothing pieces. Um, no. um, let me see what I want to say else about this. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll just say one thing really quick about this. So the scale difference um, between To the Planetarium and the E catalog piano stuff um, has really made me think about, um, yeah, like t time scale in music and also the, the kind of relationship between time and seriality and, uh, and unit collection, as I'm calling it here. So these three images on top are by an artist named Ed Atkins. Um, the two in blue, actually the cover of Steve's book is also by Ed Atkins, um, but um, this kind of weird animal creature who's drawing and then the bowl are from a series of Ed's where he's drawn little, uh, drawn on little post-it notes for his daughter Hollis every day and then um, shared the little drawing. So it's this kind of like daily, you know, practice of drawing that then is kind of put into a, serial form, which makes it something other than what it was. Uh, and then this, the one in the middle is, I just pulled this from um, Instagram yesterday, is from a new show that he has of a ton of drawings of um, his face in these kind kinds of like strange poses. Um, this is, the E stuff is a little bit different because this is a kind of like um, sitting down and doing a daily practice and then recording that, sort of journaling, drawing, or something like that. There's nothing daily about the E piano music. It's like a, it's the, the time scale is kind of like stretched and then super, super dilated at the end. Um, and it's a little bit maybe similar to um, another thing. This is from, this is the cover of a writer named Steven Zlatansky, his most recent book, and part of that book is, uh, collecting, writing down every time somebody would say good morning or good night to him and putting that in the book. Um, so we have, good night you, there's a shirt. What? There was a shirt lying here. I just, what does it say? I just threw it over there. Oh, okay, good night. And similarly kind of like, it's not quite like a daily practice, like I'm now gonna collect my thing or I'm now gonna draw this little thing, but um, uh, having a process 
I think earlier on I had a slide where I had the collecting or the jars of moisture or something. Somebody, I don't remember who said this, but somebody had this thing about writing being like you're in your apartment and you have all these jars out that are collecting the moisture in your apartment, but the moisture is like your ideas. And then you go back and you collect the little moisture out of the jars and you like make little crystals out of them or something. So um, like setting the condi setting the objective condition so that you like have a bunch of material that then you chew on or then you like chop up into these little like seashells that you arrange into a little vitrine or something like that. Um, it's like a, it's a, it's a kind of a warped relationship to like time and composition and putting stuff together because there's kind of no creativity in it because um, you don't have to be creative while you're playing the piano. In fact, it's probably better if you're not and then you listen back to it with just an interested ear or something. I think that's part of what's going on here. Um, okay, I was going to think about this Earl Sweatshirt song too and the Peter Roar, but I'm going to move on. Um, it's a Jack Whitten piece called Quantum Wall that I really like. I was just in Greece and I saw this uh, uh, thing at the Museum of Cycladic Art and this, I thought this was interesting because these are fragments of broken marble statues, figurines of people, but because they're broken and because they're arranged in such a way, they sort of like, re, almost like reapproach being uh, an arrangement of the things that they're actually representations of, like femurs or something. And so like, I don't know, there's something about like the the stages of abstraction of where it came from and then the arrangement of the pieces just like in a row like that, that makes them a little bit uncanny, which is sparking something about the um, piano music too. But I just saw this a couple of days ago, so I thought I'd put it in here. Um, maybe I'll come back to uh, Laura's music um, later if we want to. Oh yeah, kind of more just references and inspirations for um, representation of, of things that are kind of not worth representing, which I'm uh, always kind of aspiring to or inspired by. Um, just on the left there is a really, a, a still from one of many um, really, really beautiful films by the filmmaker Kevin Jerome Everson. Um, in in some of these, it's just kind of like a still uh, shot of somebody performing a magic trick, but in a way that, to me, really sparks this amazing like crisis of seeing because it's there's this like weird mediated level where like this filmmaker is just filming somebody do something which is about seeing, which is about the problem of seeing, but then the problem gets sort of like reversed when you're watching it on film, when you're watching it over and over again. I don't know why, it's just like such a simple and nothing thing that I, I have been so um, interested in for years. Um, and then th these are other artists who do um, representations of really extremely normal uh, sound or audio in a really intentional way. Um, okay, um, I'm not going to talk for too much longer, but I want to uh, talk about a few things from the stuff that I've been working on recently um, and see where that takes us and then we can chat. Um, so one is, so this is a bit from um, a longer poem by Emily, who I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's a little bit um, inaccurate to represent it like this. The first uh, column and then the second column up until the break, up until the sort of section break is one page and then the second thing is the second page. Um, but there's something about what's happening here that I'm really, really uh, interested in. I've been thinking about a lot and I'm maybe just in the interest of time, I'll just kind of read from what would be a good spot, maybe at the bottom of the um, uh, first column. As they open onto what, what is the texture of the what has given into the arc of the day? The dusk opens onto hard-boiled hands fretting with gold and fire. Their gestures carve out the space of an imageless act that the players rehearse, turning toward and away. If her brother is lying out in a field somewhere and is not allowed to be buried, is that a problem for me or not? Which world and how much apart both surveilled and ecstatic? One, please help quickly. Protect your drawings, for they are pictures of drenching waves. 
to a gesture that knows its own archive's eventual contours, a stage for itself, not a bag full of crumbled off patches of skin that just fall and land wherever and watch the ash dry across the surface. Cold beef and pork hot dog. I'm on my way to the store. Earth turn into the light, earth turn away from the light. This morning routine was a gift, a gift and an anchoring route to mark and remark as characters with social agency in their own right. Audience, chorus, class, witnesses left their own devices, inscribing, grafting, nodding, and bowing to build neighborhoods of friendships. There's something really, I, uh, I don't like know necessarily how to talk about poetry stuff in an intelligent way, but there's something really um, striking to me about what happens between this first big chunk and then on the next page, starting with cold beef and pork hot dog. And the only um, sort of uh, reference point or analogy that I've been using to think about this process um, is through the uh, trope of the holy fool. Um, and I'm, I'm going to play a piece from The Matrix in a second. Um, that's not the holy fool. That's a reference to the, what's happening in The Matrix. Um, this is the holy fool. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but there's something about the kind of like, I don't know, intense and wrought and kind of like scary poetry that I think is happening in this first chunk and that's this the speed of the um, camera in a way um, is it's a little bit like rough and fast and I find it a little bit like disturbing to to read and to be read um, and then there's this break and then there's something about the kind of like stance and the pacing of what happens starting from cold beef and pork hot dog which is which feels like um, a different character a character that I'm thinking of as the holy fool has has come onto the scene um, and kind of comes and makes an observation, for example, sees a hot dog cart and says cold beef and pork hot dog and goes to the store. Um, and then we see the earth turning into the light, the earth turning away from the light. Um, but there's something about this specific connection between this kind of fearful uh, moment in the, in the, or really the kind of fearful texture of, of this um, longer poem that this is a part of, and then this like little moment of uh, respite when um, the holy fool arrives and points out a cold beef and pork hot dog. Also, like, it's a, similarly maybe to the some of the things we were talking about earlier, it's like beef, it's like who is describing the beef and pork hot dog as cold? Well, whatever, we can come back to that. Um, it's the more I look at this little passage, the stranger it sounds to me. Um, so there was, I sort of found retrospectively after listening back to this piece that I made last year, which came out, um, I think in January of this year called the matrix. Um, and I realized that something, some connection that was in that piece sounded to me also like the arrival of the Holy fool in a way that I'm, I'm now only thinking this through for the first time with you all, so I'd be curious what you think, but um, I just kind of wanted to put those two things next to each other to like see if there's, if this is anything or if there's a, there's a connection that's worth thinking about here. Um, so the, the little segment that we'll listen to, so the, the Matrix is from a split cassette that I did with my friend Merche. Um, so it's like a 20 minute piece that sort of brings in some of the elements of, um, <laughs> some of the elements of to the planetarium and that approach to sort of archival sound and YouTube Kabbalah stuff. Um, and then also some of the more, uh, concrete and, and detailed kind of composition of notes and tracing and stuff, which I'll say more about in a second. But what we're going to hear is a little segment, uh, clip from this film, um, Tevya, which is the greatest Yiddish picture ever made. Tevya, I think was the, if somebody knows, you can either nod or shake your head. But Tevya, I believe, is the narrator in Fiddler on the Roof. He's like a recurring character in in this kind of, like, uh, I guess, turn of the 20th century um, Yiddish literature. But this is a movie about Tevya. Uh, so it's a, little, it's a little audio from Tevya, which is then covered over with some stuff of some sound that I'm making intentionally, which has turned the ending of this movie, the sort of uh, tragic ending of this movie, into what sounds to me like somebody is trying to open a um, 
treasure chest and failing, they can't open it. And then something like the Holy Fool um, emerges. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of the, there's, there's something about the, the relationship between that first half of the, um, Tevya and the, and the treasure chest that can't be opened. And then the arrival of this, um, little musical segment at the end that, um, teaches me something about what's happening in Emily's poem that we were looking at too, except for that, the scene that the, um, Holy Fool arrives onto in Emily's poem, I think is more manic, and the scene that the Holy Fool arrives onto in The Matrix is a little bit more depressive. But in both cases, the kind of fool comes and um, pierces through a kind of social uh, setting with with their foolishness. I should probably say something about the Holy Fool too. Um, there, so it's like a, it's like a, um, uh, trope, I guess, in, in literature and art of some kind. This is, this is often re sort of referred to when talking about the Holy Fool, but I do think that there's a, are there any like art historians here who can help me here? Because I don't actually know about this, but um, feel free to shout. But uh, I see that the Holy Fool and the Fool for Christ are sometimes um, uh, 
re seen as replaceable, and I don't think that they are. I think, at least the way that I'm thinking about these, these are different, really different characters. This is a fool for Christ, but often people will be like, oh, it's a holy fool. Um, this, this character here, that's the holy fool. Uh, or actually, I, I think that this is more like the fool for Christ. Um, Nesterov also was a, um, was a hardcore anti-communist right-wing czarist during this Russian Revolution. Um, and also in Emily's poem, there's a reference to Antigone um, here. If her brother is lying out in a field somewhere and is not allowed to be buried, is that a problem for me or not? It's a reference to Antigone. Antigone is kind of like a holy fool character in a way. So the way that I'm thinking about how this character works, which is different from Nesterov, so if an, art, if an art historian can tell me more about how this works, I'd love to hear about it. But um, the holy fool, the way I'm thinking about it, sort of arrives in the space, and by the sheer force of them taking things literally and being honest and asking sort of honest questions about a situation, they kind of shatter the guile and the um, kind of corruption of a, of a certain kind of social setting. So that's what Antigone does in a way. She just kind of like... She identifies, a so her brother um, has been killed and he's, parting, he's fighting in a civil war over Thebes. Um, and I think it's her uncle who runs Thebes at the time, but because her brother was uh, sort of um, mutinying against the leader of Thebes or was a sort of doing, in, doing some kind of like treasonous warfare, um, the person that person who runs Thebes, the king of Thebes, orders that the brother not be buried um, and is left to the carry-on, left unburied in the field, which is a punishment, the worst possible punishment at this time. Um, and Antigone also has a, is, is honor-bound, duty-bound as, as this person's sister to give him a proper burial. So she identifies just through being honest and, um, I don't know, asking questions or whatever, uh, uh, contradiction between the laws of the state and the and the duties of family and there's a whole way that that sort of transforms the understanding of the relationship between the family and the state um or the polis in the in the ancient world but antigone kind of doesn't even really have to go out of her own way she just kind of has to like be herself in a certain kind of way and she and she creates problems in a world that's kind of sort of um woven through um, corruption and, and lies and things like that. Um, the Fool for Christ is a different different kind of guy. Yeah. There's a couple of people in the chat saying maybe also like Dostoyevsky's idiot. Yeah, oh my God, thank you so much. I have the idiot next. Um, totally. The idiot is the, I think that's the real case in point. Um, uh, that's Dostoevsky's drawing of the idiot, which I love. So strange. Um, but also, yeah, the idiot is great. Thank you to whoever made that comment. Um, the other holy fool that I'm really interested in is Amelia Bedelia. Do you guys know? Does anybody know Amelia Bedelia? One person who's American knows me. I thought of Amelia Bedelia as a, as a British thing, but I don't think it is. I think it's American. Um, has anybody, I, other than Lauren, anybody else heard of this? OK, a series of children's books um, that are great and uh, the, the premise sort of is that Amelia Bedelia takes everything that is said to her foolishly literally, so literally that she gets into all this trouble or something, or she, she creates all these problems in her circumstances. So this is a scene from one of the books where she says, now let's see what this list says. She's taking care of a house, Amelia Bedelia read. Change the towels in the green bathroom. Amelia Bedelia found the green bathroom. Those towels are very nice. Why change them, she thought. Then Amelia Bedelia remembered what Mrs. Rogers had said. She must do the, just what the list told her. Well, all right, said Amelia Bedelia. Amelia Bedelia got some scissors. She snipped a little here and a little there, and she changed those towels. Which is so beautiful. All of them are like this. This is the only bit in Amelia Bedelia. But this is exactly the holy fool, right? Like, she's... Or, like, to make it into the kind of political statement of what the holy fool does the background premise would have to be that the house that she's employed by or whatever the situation is, is somehow corrupt and is taking advantage of her. And she uh, ruins all of the um, 
linens just by taking the rules literally. I don't think that's really the premise of this. It's just like, oh, look at this foolish person taking the rules so literally. It's also about um, so much about language because I imagine that um, many people who are reading Amelia Bedelia are also learning to read and they're learning about the relationship between literal and figurative language in many ways. Um, so that's kind of what's being played on. Um, but the kind of like foolish literalness um, that you can enter into a situation with is uh, is one that um, I find really interesting and also connects in a really fascinating way. I've just recently, I just added this um, slide yesterday because I was just thinking about it, to the Zohar um, and the Kabbalistic stuff. There's a bit, um, I'm way out of my uh, league in terms of linguistic understanding for this particular point. So, I've, you know, I'm taking somebody else's word for it that this is correct, but if I get something wrong, let me know because I'm also trying to learn. Um, so we all know it starts in the beginning, God created, right? And the Hebrew Bereshit bara Elohim, I guess the way that those words uh, work is that Bereshit means in the beginning or with beginning. Um, Elohim is God and bara means created. So to take that little passage very literally, it would say in the beginning created God. And so these Kabbalistic um, uh, commenters on the Torah doing this kind of mystical midrash of this text, take that little Amelia Bedelia-esque flip of the word order and say, okay, well, if it really says Bereshit bara Elohim in the beginning created God, there's an implied subject that created God before. It's not saying that in the beginning God created, which is the standard translation, standard understanding, um, but there's a, there's a hidden bracketed implied subject it behind, before the created which is a radical gesture to say that god was created rather than the creator that god was caused rather than is the, the first cause um, and so then that gets elaborated and can be retranslated or is retranslated as with beginning the unnameable entity and so eternity created the entity that we call god so there's something actually that comes even before so this is a very amelia bedelia Esque reinterpretation of the first three words of the of the Bible in a way, um, and I think that there's a little bit of this kind of uh, willingness to be extremely foolish and willingness to take things too literally and um, and kind of like cut through the guile that is uh, kind of at the core of a lot of what I kind of think music making. Um, what makes music making interesting for me. Um, and so that's maybe that's part of why when I was reading Emily's bit and thinking about that, why this notion of the holy fools stands out to me so much because it's also a kind of allegory for writing or for making music um, in a way that I haven't really mapped out yet. Um, I'm gonna stop in just one minute. Uh, but first, no, I'm gonna skip some of this bit. But it's not going to let me, is it? Shh. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just end. This is a little detail from the Jules Bastien Lepage painting of Joan of Arc, which I love. You see right in the center, such a strange little moment that feels like actually anchoring the entire piece. Um, I'm going to end by playing a bit of, yeah, I'm going to play a little bit of um, the beginning of this new thing I'm working on now um, called The Holy Restaurant. Uh, the, so the, the part that I was identifying as the holy fool in the matrix a few minutes ago, the way that that process was put together is um, the musical part after the uh, tevya and the unopenable chest. Um, is that there's a, a recording of me and my nephew playing a little children's keyboard, my nephew who at the time was probably five or six, um, and kind of like hitting buttons on the thing and then taking that recording, leaving it in, but also tracing over it with playing piano over it, transcribing it, and then uh, arranging a kind of MIDI chamber orchestra to play over it. And this process of tracing has been... Um, has been one that I've been really interested in lately. Uh, and I'm just gonna play this little clip, which opens with a bit of, of tracing um, and then moves into a different kind of form. And I'll say one word about that and then 
Um, I'll shut up and we can talk. the keyboard in the background, tracing over it with guitar. That's how this tracing is working, working right now. that the tracing starts to sort of disperse after a little while. It gets a little bit less exact. So the first bit is the last thing I'll say. Um, in the tracing bit, this is sort of related in my mind to um, uh, plain, plain chant, where in this example, like everybody's singing the same melody. Um, so there's a kind of like commitment to unison melody throughout the entire thing. And then what's happening in the end of this segment that we just listened to, where there's this kind of like cloud of, of chamber instruments coming in, is that um, I didn't really point it out, but there's a, a constant hum, which is happening from the oven in my apartment. Uh, and that 
is recorded, and then all of these other instruments kind of come in to improvise over the drone of that hum, which is in the middle, which um, in my mind is connected to a slightly later form of medieval kind of early pre-polyphony where um, the lowest voice is singing one pitch and everyone else is kind of improvising over it. So there's a kind of, um, not in a developmentalist kind of way, but there's a, a reference point to the kind of fundamental forms of not even just polyphonic music in a kind of uh, specific way, but just ways of making music together in different kind of choreographic shapes that different voices can do. Um, and so that piece from Holy Restaurant that we just listened to is kind of traces the movement from plain chant to um, florid organum. Uh, anyway, lots more to say, but I'll stop there and we can chat. Thank you so much for listening. Um, oh. Hello, hello. <clears throat> Amazing. Thanks very much. Sorry, I'm going to come a bit closer so you can see me. Um, do you mind if I say it? Is that right? Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I've scribbled loads. Um, sorry, jumped out. Uh, I've got some questions, but does anybody else have any questions first? And then do we have any questions in the chat? Not yet? Cool. I'll start, and then if anybody thinks of anything, we can jump in. Um, my first question is kind of funny, because the way I've written it is sort of in the same, is the same topic as the question, which is about <laughs> sound collage, which is, so I guess for everybody, I've been a big fan of Derek's work for a while, but I've never heard you speak about it. I've never known that much about it. Um, and you've actually shown things that, you know, some of it was like very new to me. That I didn't know about it. So, but something that I guess I pick up on a lot because it's an interest of mine is sound collage and the way you presented the research and the topics and the resources all kind of further for me fed into this thing of collage of taking sources from different places and in the sound work itself there's a lot of taking sources and then adding things and you spoke about Arthur Jaffer and this thing of archival footage and self-made mm -hmm. material mm -hmm. which I mean I'm, I might be wrong, but I feel like you know that's something that is really present in in your work. Mm -hmm. So I think I guess the question is like, is that something that you are happy to be attached to? Is because you know there is this there is like a lineage of sound collage works and and it has it has a, a style and a, a thing. It has a romanticism to it. Mm -hmm quite often, I think. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm interested just to hear you talk about this, a little bit more about this combination of archival and self-made and where, the, you know, like, apart from the, all the amazing references you've shown us, like, where the original stem for working in this way comes from, you know, does it have a connection to your academic practice, which is heavily based in research, or is it mm -hmm. like an interest from... DIY music, mm -hmm. <laughs> or you know, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rory. It's a good question. Um, I guess that, yeah, there are some conspicuous absences in kind of naming my influences or references or something. And, you know, the, the, the collage, the sound collage, DIY music world was and remains a deep reference point for me on a on a personal level on the level of my record label stuff too and my own work i think um maybe it's been a matter of like searching a little bit outside of i mean this sort of what i was saying in reference to, to the planetarium where i wanted to be able to do something that was going to be beyond the two 20 minute sides of an lp and a very sort of like you know formally square thing that many people have done and like fitting the sound collage into that 
form is, uh, you know, we've sort of established what that does and what the kind of like aesthetic arc of that is. And I'm still interested in that and listen to music all the time in many ways, but um, searching for other reference points that could like teach me something else about what collage can be or bricolage or montage or whatever. Um, and specifically having to look to places other than music and other than other than experimental music or sound art or whatever you want to call it, sound collage. And so I think that's part of why so many of my references are um, to film, because it has a different set of formal constraints and mediations that people are working with and against all the time. And it taught me, is teaching me, continues to teach me about different ways of putting things together that would add up to something just a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit less than like an, a, a record, you know, like a, the record is the sort of, you know, in like Western classical music s standard of criticism or whatever, we think of the symphony of the composer as their sort of like major statement. That's like where, the, that's the form that their major statement takes. And that has certain kinds of formal um, principles or codes that that's gonna come with. And then to try to write something that's going to be something other than what's expected of you when you're asked to make a statement or something or make a, make a, a major statement of 40 minute work or a 25 minute work or something. You have to look to other things and you also have to sort of make stuff that's kind of ridiculous. Like it's it, the, to the planetarium stuff, like I, it, it makes me feel extremely good to make that. I, I like to make it and I like to do the research and listen to it or like, you know, put, put it all together and stuff like that. But like, I don't actually expect people to sit down and listen to a 10 hour mix of foolish pieces of sound, you know, like it's, there's something else that's happening there, which is why the reference point for To the Planetarium is more like radio, where you kind of have it on in the background, or you have it on and have it off or something like that. But yeah, I guess to answer your question, getting the sound collage thing comes to me with all this kind of formal baggage of like, oh, you're making the state, you've made the collage and you're making the statement and here you go. And the, the very small stuff on the piano and the very big stuff on the To the Planetarium is ways for me to like ask different kind of um, formal questions or problems with a similar kind of approach to archival and, and stuff. Yeah, I think that's what's like very beautiful about it is there's still feels like a commitment to this way of thinking. And that's kind of why I mentioned that the way that you've even presented things today feel like they represent this as well. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, you're making work which sort of pushes it further outside of this thing of yeah, the right. record. And, and that's, yeah, it's very cool. There's something that, and it just, it was kind of the way that it, had me thinking whilst you were talking is just like I was completely jumping around everywhere being like oh because you know quite often when we have lectures or when we think about practitioners here well you know if somebody says the word field recording then we start to think about <laughs> all sorts of stuff tied to field recording the, the equipment crocodiles it, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the material the equipment what it means to press record what it means to have a microphone, you know, um, Mark, Peter Wright was talking about, you know, what does it mean to hold a microphone? How does that translate to human hearing? And then, but in this it was it really nice because, I don't, I'm just reflecting out loud, but yeah. it becomes much more about the the parts and how they come together. And there's this way that you can sort of travel through all of the references. There's this book by uh, Daisy Hilliard that I'm reading at the moment in which she sort of recounts various different happenings from her childhood. And she'll sort of talk for half a page about her and her friend meeting at this tree and then one word in that will lead on to a different memory from childhood around the same time, and mm -hmm. she'll talk about that for a bit, and then another one, and then another one, and then she'll come back to the tree, and it's, yeah, I just really enjoyed the way, of, the way of working there. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the formal kind of secret of 
this also, which you're, it seems you're exactly picking up on, is that um, this talk is put together with the same method in mind as to the planetarium is put together. So it's the same, there's a kind of formal homology that I'm trying to explore. And the point is that it should work in both places because it's not a musical-ish, it's not a composerly form, it's like a different kind of research or something, but that's a different version of saying, I think, what you're noting. Yeah, Thank you. No, very nice. And then I'm going to keep going. Cause, sorry. Oh. Hey, uh, thank you, Tarek, for sharing with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I want to ask, I should have wrote down my question now. Um, I want to ask you how you go about using uh, references around, like, spiritual, I guess, uh, belief systems and also, yeah, wor words like holy and, and sacred um, in a, let's say, in a culture that would be um, against this, uh, see this as a form of essentialism maybe. Mm. Um, is this, for you, is this a intentional reaction to, to a situation um, that you want to see change in? Mm. Um, or is it more like a undirected kind of creative desire towards certain certain ideas? Um, yeah, and then also I'm interested in the I'm really interested in this uh, this idea of the sparks like outwardly rather than returning to the whole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, does that also relate to like a current? situation or current culture that that we live in is that is that a reaction from from your side yeah those are good questions thank you very much um in terms of the the sort of religious signifiers in the work um i mean yeah i think you're right to trouble that maybe a little bit and like i you know i grew up secular jewish and so i don't have like I've come to that kind of field of signifiers as something that's possibly interesting and capacious to explore something else about what I'm interested in about making music or being alive or whatever um, because I didn't have to get out of it in a way that a lot of people feel like they do and so they have a very very different set of associations with that language um, I guess I will say that like I mean, one bit that I was going to say some of, but I skipped over when I was talking about Walter Benjamin is this really interesting image that he has. So a lot of that sort of um, uh, critical language about him or critical commentary about his um, work has puzzled over the problems, the, the apparent problems in the relationship between his Jewish mysticism and his Marxism. Um, I don't see those two things as in contradiction with one another at all. Uh, and I don't, I get where the thing comes from if you have a certain understanding of Marxism and analysis of capitalism, which claims to be scientific or something, and Jewish mysticism is anti scientific or something like that. So it seems to be a contradiction in terms, but also, A, Marxism is structured like Christianity, anyways, with the formal arc of what's being described um, in kind of Marxist telos or whatever, but also, something that he says in regard also to Kafka, which is that um, politics and mysticism are the two ends of the bow. And to make the work, you have to pull the bow back and the, and the politics and the mysticism come close to touching but never touch. And then when you release the bow, they go back out or something like that. So I think there's a way that like, I don't know. I don't know how, how much it's it's apparent on the surface. I mean, the, the, the religious and sacred signifiers are much more on the surface on purpose, but to me that's pointing to a kind of submerged other set of commitments and signifiers, which is maybe the other end of the bow or something, which like, I guess I could describe as like Marxism. Not, e not even necessarily Marxism, but like some sort of commitment to like, like how the world could and should be better than the way that it is currently organized and everything, which maybe goes right to your second question. Um, so they're associated for me through the figure of the bow and through just the kind of principle that, that 
you know, a, li a little bit of woo-woo is correct, like, because the, the world actually is a little bit woo-woo. Like, you know, like, you can't go, I, I think, like, you can't go all the way into the, like, scientific, this, from a very specific understanding of what scientific means when it's used to describe Marxism, of this, like, deeply disenchanted analysis of the world. Like, the world isn't actually disenchanted like that. So, like, so there's something in the, in the kind of, like, religiosity or this or the sacredness as a as a as a resource for making work which is pointing to the fact that it's completely inextricable from actual concrete political commitments that i wouldn't put on the surface of the work because that makes it just detonate and not be that interesting to me to me to make or whatever but um they're totally bound up together so thanks for the questions it's really interesting We've got a couple in the chat. Do you want to read them or do you want me to? Um, so Emily Martin in the chat has asked, how do you personally recognise a spark? Do you find that there are some times when it's easier or harder to recognise a spark? Mm -hmm. Emily asked that, you said? Emily. Yeah, that's Emily whose poems we were reading and who I have the staff picks with. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe in some ways you kind of make you make your own, or you you find them wherever they are, and maybe there's a kind of like like at the end of the Matrix, not my piece, the movie The Matrix, where he's like seeing in code, you know, he's like achieved full Matrix vibe, and he's seeing everybody in green rain stuff. Like, I think maybe the, it's relating to the other question about religion, too. I think actually the world is all sparks. Like, there is something about that. But it's a matter of, like, which ones do you want to nurture? Which ones are speaking to the particular kinds of problems that you're thinking about or, or um, working on right now? Because, I mean, it's, that's part of why it's been funny to go through some of this old, relatively old stuff, stuff I was working on about three years ago, and listen to a segment of To the Planetarium and just being like, A, I don't remember this at all. B, I don't remember why I put it together like this at all. But like, I do remember the feeling of it mattering that it was put together in this particular kind of way. And similar with, maybe with the e-catalog stuff too, where like there's some of these little segments, there's hundreds of these little pieces coming from other hundreds of hours of the recording. And I go back and listen and I have no memory of certainly have no memory of playing them, that's the point, but then I have no memory of even putting them together. And so there's a, this funny relationship between sparks and time, which I guess is appropriate because that's what a spark is, right? Sparks up and then goes down. Um, but definitely comes from the principle of like, you seize, the, you seize the spark, you see the spark, but then you also seize the spark in the moment that it's happening and then you give it connection to other sparks or something and maybe build a small fire or something, whatever, whatever you're doing, but um, recognition. Yes, yeah, good question. I don't know, Emily. Thank you. The next question is from Mike Barron, who <laughs> might be familiar to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, can you talk about the implicit slash explicit irony between Amelia Bedelia slash Holy Fool's lack of subtext and self-consciousness, which ends up being so rich? makes me think of your approach to and philosophy of art. Quotes, it is what it is, now what is it? Wow. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. That's a good question. The sub Can you just read that again, actually? Yeah. Can you talk about the implicit slash explicit irony between Amelia Bedelia's and Holy Fool's lack of subtext and self-consciousness, which ends up being so rich? makes me think of your approach to and philosophy of art. It is what it is, now what is it? That's such an interesting question, Dad, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the foolishness, so uh, Amelia Bedelia is presented to us as like, she's just like this, this is how she, uh, deals with language. This is how she is in the world, which is what makes the book funny or whatever. She's not putting it on. But this is sort of what I, and the idiot too, presumably. 
this is sort of what I was pointing at maybe in speaking about how there's something about the holy fool which I find to be an allegory for just making stuff in the first place, but the difference is that you have to decide that it's worth doing to take something so foolishly literally or something. So you sort of have to like, maybe in that way it's more like the fool for Christ, who apparently was not born so, right, but decides to become a fool for Christ. It's a different story, I guess, but um, yeah, like the, like, committing to be an, not even committing to be an artist necessarily as a way of life, but just like living with your curiosity in whatever way that that uh, takes shape or something, you, you sort of like agree to enter into whatever question you're asking as a, as a fool, which I think that's what makes it, that's what gives it that kind of woo-woo other thing that can't just be scientifically taken apart and it's always going to be a little bit more than the sum of its parts. So I think that taking on Amelia Bedelia as a as a principle or something or as a as an ethic when I think about what is what is worth it about making music or something. So it's like I have to get behind my own back, take on a take on that character intentionally instead of just like think that I'm it uh, uh, authentically or something because that's not what I'm saying. Thanks, Dad. Um, there's also a request from Linny Krell, if mm -hmm. I pronounced that correctly. If there's time, I'd love to hear the digest version of what was on the skipped old sweatshirt slide. A smiley face. Oh, um, I'll just go back. Actually, this gonna it's gonna want to play some of these things. No, 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 no. We're not doing all this right now. Um, you've already heard it. That would be a good mashup, actually. Leonin and Salve Regina. Come on. Okay. Okay, we're done. Uh, so I won't go back to it, but um, so that slide with the Ed's drawings and Steve's book with the good night passages um, uh, and the little bits from Peter Rohr, who's a German artist who died really young, who's making a lot of kind of like serial, small serial pop art minimalism, I guess, in the 1960s. Um, and Earl Sweatshirt, it was this piece of Earl Sweatshirt's it's not it's exclusive to him, obviously, but um, but just a really, really strange little synth, uh, not even synth, keyboard, Rhodes or something, um, passage has been looped, cut and looped, but it's not square in the way that we think of like beat-oriented loop-based production music being square. It's like, it's wrong and off-kilter and feels kind of like amateur in a way that I'm really drawn to. And what's interesting to me about that one little segment um, is that he's talking in that piece about his grandmother and uh, memories of his grandmother and everything, but this little, the loop that the song is based from feels like it kind of has this objectness as if it's a kind of like tchotchke on his grandmother's like table break front or something in the living room that then he like sees slash hears and then sparks, almost Proust-like, sparks this kind of memory of his grandmother that he then sort of like thinks about over the song. But there's a kind of like the weirdness of the loop, which I think is a lot of Earl Sweatshirt's music and a lot of other um, music that's kind of like speaking to it, uh, sparks a kind of thought that goes over it. And in the E catalog, I'm not approaching it in any way in that kind of like that kind of loop-based production thing, but it is adjacent to that practice, I think, that form of listening in a certain kind of way. But the, but the thought that it sparks on top of it is left implicit or something. Um, but I find in a lot of Earl Sweatshirt's music, but especially in that piece, it kind of um, teaches me something formally about the meaning of those little, um, why you would loop a very s strange and non-idiomatic bit of, of keyboard music and just loop it and then have it looping and then think about what you're listening to a little bit. And then he, he makes that explicit by then speaking over the, over the track. Thanks, Lenny. Oh, we got any questions in the room? No. All right. Uh, we've only I think got, we, we, there oh, is one, we, one back there. There maybe. is one. Oh, um, I just wanted you to elaborate on the, whole uh, um, concentric palaces concept <laughs> within Jew Jewish mysticism and what the name you gave it to was before. 
with the name I gave. Sorry, say, say more about so that like, last bit. Um, I don't know, you said it was like a part of Jewish mysticism that had a specific name. Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a that bit about the concentric palaces is a passage from a book called the Zohar, Z-O-H-A-R, which is a book it's written in like the 11th or 12th century by a Spanish uh, Kabbalist, uh, Moises de Leon, but written for, under the premise of having been written a thousand years prior by Rabbi Shimon. But it wasn't actually, but that was the kind of, it was framed in that way, like as if it was a sacred uh, thousand year old text, partially to um, make some of its more radical theological claims go down a little bit easier. Uh, but I get this idea of the concentric palaces from a, a passage of the Zohar, and I just think it's such an outrageous image to think about the structure of the universe as a series of concentric palaces that are also brains inside of buildings that hold the brains, which then become themselves brains, and that expands out. And I'm just like, it's I'm completely befuddled by that image, and so I'm just I don't I don't know how to elaborate on it. In other it, words, it kind of made me think of like the fractal nature of like the universe and how everything yeah. within itself is the same as it like uh, goes on. You mentioned um, how like spirals outwards, like growing. And it's just like the way that how the universe spirals and like as it cascades, it grows and right. um, it adapts and mutates as it goes along. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think there is something about that and that the sort of scalar iterability of the fractal sort of framework. The weird thing about the palaces, which is kind of makes it a little bit different from that, in my mind, is the matter of light, that like something can be lit or unlit, and for it to be lit would then be the condition of possibility for yet another enclosing palace to come over it. I don't see this this question of fullness and emptiness quite the same way in like a fractal kind of understanding, but it's very, it's similar. That's an interesting thought. Thank you for that. Yeah. Ooh. Um, it's half past, so I'm going to save everyone from my boring uh, <laughs> record nerd questions and end the talk. But I just want to say thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll be back in here next week, so please do all attend. Thank you. <laughs>